Well, this morning, we're going to continue our study in 1 Peter. If you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 4 through 12 is what we have been studying. We're, we're looking at the New Covenant temple. And I love the, the Old Testament. Uh, it's temple's fulfillment is what we're looking at. God no longer dwells in temples that are made with hands. We need to understand this. We've got to get it. The church is not a building. It's not a sanctuary that we gather in. But now Peter's telling us we are the temple of God. And God the Father laid the cornerstone, the cornerstone being Jesus Christ. He laid him as the foundation for the whole temple. And the builders looked at this cornerstone and they rejected him. They saw no value in the cornerstone. But to God, he was choice. And he was precious to the Father. He was his daily delight. He delighted over all the excellencies that were in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was laid as the chief's cornerstone for the construction then of this new temple. Jesus is the foundation. He is what everything else in the temple is built off of as the cornerstone. And it all looks to him. It leans on him. And it trusts in him. It depends on him. It believes in him. He is the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. So, so sweet the reality of what God is building. Now we need something to build a temple with. We, we need stones to build it. And the problem is, is that we are all dead stones. We are stone dead spiritual people. We are stillborns when we come in to this world. And so how do you build a spiritual temple with people who are dead spiritually, who see no value in the cornerstone. You see more value in being accepted by people than this amazing cornerstone foundation that God has built. Come to him, he says. Come as we come to him and believe in Jesus. His life is infused into us by his spirit. Dead stones become living stones in our text. We are now alive to God in Christ Jesus. We get life. Dead stones and trespasses and sins have life. The life of God is now in the soul of man. He breathes it right into us. Then we are placed perfectly in the building of this spiritual temple. And this is now, guys, where the glory of God is manifested. It is no longer in that Old Testament temple. It is the the saints of God now together uh, in this temple, living stones, thirsting for the word of God and thirsting for the living Christ so that we might grow in respect to salvation. And as we are growing by coming to him, we're putting on display the glory of God to this world. And we are loving with agape. We love with this supernatural love that God has put in us. And we put off in verse 1 of chapter 2 the sins of self. We are done with those sins. We're alive to God and we're alive to other people. And in this, the glory of God is manifested to this world. This is the temple of God. And then Peter adds this to his metaphor. We are the priests in the temple. The stones now become the priests And no more do we need a a higher up to represent us before God where there was God and man. We need someone really spiritual to represent us for God. We no longer need a priest. There is now full glorious access to him for every believer in Jesus Christ. You are now the priests of God and you come into his presence freely with access. And he says, you come now and offer up spiritual sacrifices through Jesus Christ. And all we do now is through him. It is through Christ that we offer up our lives and that we give our lips to edify and build up and we give our resources that that name would be proclaimed and we take the gifts that God gives us and we serve the body of Christ through him. It is through him that anything that we do is acceptable to God. This pleasing aroma to our God. So beautiful Well, Peter doesn't stop there. We get to go deeper and further this morning. And so what I want to do is go to our Father in heaven and just pray that he would minister to our hearts as we continue to look at this beautiful temple and the cornerstone. Let's pray. (coughs) Father God, we come before you and I thank you for this temple that you're building. 
I thank you for the choice and precious cornerstone that you chose to build this whole church on. I thank you for Christ and all of his glory and all of his beauty. Lord, that we are to be built on him. He's where we find everything. Now, all of our life is based on that cornerstone. The trajectory of where you've placed us in this temple is all based on the cornerstone. And so I pray, Lord, that we cannot make enough of Jesus Christ. I pray that every heart here loves him. Paul said, let, let them be anathema if they don't love Jesus Christ. He is so lovely. I just pray every heart here loves the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you, God, for this temple that you're building. And I pray that Southside Bible Church would put your glory on display. If there are any unbelievers who have wandered in here this morning, that they would say, surely God is in this place. And they would marvel at what they see uh, and, and hear in this temple. God, we thank you for its glory and all of its beauty. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll look with me at 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 4 through 8. And coming to him as to a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and it became a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they're disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed." And so we've looked the last two weeks at the construction of the temple in verses 4 through 5. And now this morning we're going to take up verses 6 through 8 as we look at the foundation of this temple. I want you to see that everything we've been studying was promised in the Old Testament. There, there's, there's, it's new, but it's promised. It's what they've been waiting for and what we've been looking for. So this is the foundation of the temple coming from the Old Testament. And so Peter is going to bring forth some Old Testament passages that teach us the exact same thing. He's going to do what Christ really did on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus sat on the, or Peter actually sat on that Sermon on the Mount and he heard Jesus teach it. And Jesus, at the end of that sermon, he drove his listeners to a decision. You've heard about my kingdom. You've heard about what it looks like and its character and, and how to get into it. But now it's not enough just to hear. He's going to say, you've got to make a decision. And he calls them, I want you to enter at the narrow gate that leads to life, not the broad way that leads to destruction. You've got to make a choice. You can't just keep sitting around listening. And so Peter is going to do the exact same thing now with his temple. It's not enough to just hear about this cornerstone. It's not enough to just listen to sermons about it. It's not even enough to say, that's cool. You have to decide, what are you going to do with the cornerstone? You must make a decision and as I said in the Sermon on the Mount, no decision is a decision. It's like jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. And if I'm trying to decide whether to pull that ripcord or not, I'll tell you right now, no decision is a decision. And you are perishing. And no decision is a decision. And so Peter is going to drive every heart this morning, what are you going to do with the cornerstone? And you can't ignore it and you can't keep running from it because no decision is a decision. And if you die in a car wreck driving home, you made a decision if you've ignored this. So this morning, I'm asking every soul here to look at this cornerstone and say, what have I done with such a precious choice cornerstone that God has laid for this temple to be built on? So it's not enough to adore it. It's not enough to even say that you believe it. It's not enough to take pictures, a little selfie with the cornerstone. All of your eternity is based on what you do with Christ. And, and Peter's going to drive it, and I'm going to do the same thing this morning. And I want everyone in this room to have fallen upon this cornerstone, that nobody walks out of here without having life, dead stones being made alive in Jesus Christ. 
So let's try and understand why Peter pulled these passages up to his mind and he inserted them into this temple picture. So let's start with verse 6. Verse 6 is a quote from Isaiah 28, 16. I'll just read it to you. He says, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. So if you'll just flip over, keep your hand in 1 Peter and turn over to Isaiah 28. I, we're going to look at three Old Testament passages today, and I, I just want you to wrestle with me and get in the context and understand the beauty of what Peter is doing here. So as you turn, I, I just want to set maybe the larger context with Isaiah. Is it, it's a message of judgment in this section upon Ephraim because of their disobedience and their unbelief. And so the whole point of Isaiah will be this. Those who trust in the Lord's Messiah will escape judgment. He's saying it again and again. So he says, don't put your trust in foreign alliances or, or military strength. Don't, don't look to other things to deliver you. Look to God. Believe this message and you will be saved. Wait on the Lord. That great Isaiah chapter 40. Trust in Him is what this message of Isaiah is driving to. The immediate context, Isaiah is speaking against the princes and the leaders of Jerusalem, and they had become very smug, and they thought that their city would never be overthrown, despite what the prophets are saying and telling them, in their minds, there's no way that this is going to happen. We're the holy city. We, we can sin, we can offer up lame sacrifices to God, the weak and the blind. We're the people of God. We have nothing to fear, American Christianity in a nutshell. The northern tribes, yes, they have already been defeated. They, they are not the holy city. They weren't, so they could be destroyed, but no way could the southern city ever be overthrown. Jerusalem is the site of the holy temple where God's presence dwells. No way is God going to let that happen. He'll never let us be conquered. Jerusalem is the place where God has chosen to disclose Himself. Zion is God's holy hill. It's His glory. And so they reject Jeremiah and his prophecies from God and Isaiah. They just have no category for what this prophet is saying. They are secure in the shadow of the temple. They are secure in their religious privilege. I, I don't have to worry. I'm secure. My, my parents were Christians. I'm a Baptist. I'm secure in all of my religious privilege. Well, look at Isaiah 28, 14. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, O scoffers, who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we've made a pact, the overwhelming scourge will not reach us when it passes by. No way. For we have made falsehood our refuge and we have concealed ourselves with deception. He mocks them. They have made a contract with death. They're safe. Nothing can touch them. Well, look at verse 16. So God says this to them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. And he who believes in it will not be disturbed. I'm going to build a foundation. I'm going to lay a cornerstone. And those who believe will be saved. Those are the ones who will be saved from the judgment and punishment of God. Your covenant with death is going to be annulled. It's going to be wiped out. It's going to be a nation that's going to come upon you and destroy you. So your presumed security is not really secure at all. But in Zion, I will place the secure cornerstone. So all of your hope and foreign alliances, your religious privilege that God will never do is insecure. But the one thing that is secure is this foundation stone, and I'm going to place it in Zion. And only those who are solidly grounded on this cornerstone are secure. You are so secure if you're grounded in God's cornerstone. Quit boasting and being haughty. Quit bragging about all of your security, your possessions and person and all of your control and all of your authority, your mockers. And Peter talks about them in his next epistle where they say, where's the Lord? 
Things that go as they've always come. When is your so-called Lord going to return? And he says, don't you know a thousand days is like a day in the Lord's sight? Is, is it, there's always mockers. You're always going to have people mocking the cornerstone. So you can mock the Lord. You can ridicule believers. But there was a day that came upon those in Jerusalem who were doing it. And they were destroyed. And they were wiped out. They were not safe in all of their reasonings and all of their mockings. That you can mock Christianity as much as you want. There was a day of reckoning and it came upon them. There's only one way to be safe. When the scourge of the Lord comes, and when it comes again in a final judgment, when, the, when the, uh, Jesus comes back again as a lion, I tell you, it is the stone that has been laid in Zion as your refuge and your safe place. The chief cornerstone that the Father has laid in His temple. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. This is the safe place. This is the secure cornerstone. The world is coming undone all around us. But on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. We will not be overthrown. We will not be overcome. And Peter, now the saints of God are being persecuted greatly. And he gets it. And he gets that Jesus is the cornerstone and he's been built into the temple, the church. He's choice and precious. He's a massive cornerstone and the whole church is being built on this foundation. And Peter gets, he says, he who believes in him will never be disappointed. I've believed in a lot of things that I was disappointed in. This one, you will never be disappointed. And it's a, in the Greek, it's a double emphatic. You in no way ever will be disappointed. The one who hopes in this Christ, you're never going to be disappointed when, when that judgment day comes. I want you to lay hold of that. Those who are hoping in the holy city and their privileges and their righteousness and not in the cornerstone were destroyed. If you're hoping in religion, coming to Southside Bible Church, being a good person, you will be destroyed. Do not hope in that. What have you done with the stone? Believe in him because he was God's choice stone and he was precious to God. Trust in him and everything being built off of him in your life and you'll never be disappointed. You will never be destroyed in this life. And when you die and see him face to face and you see how precious your cornerstone is, how righteous he really is, the one who believes in him will never be disappointed. No, never. He'll never say, away from me, I never knew you. you. You will be safe through judgment, secure for all of eternity. But the ones who stumbled over him, such a big stone. You, you try to ignore Jesus and you spend your whole life stumbling over him. You know, I'm, I'm going to ignore Jesus. Ooh, I can't hear you. And your whole life you keep stumbling, falling on your face. You're miserable, misery and destruction. You, you kind of spent your whole life stumbling over him, tripping and falling. Romans 3 says, destruction and misery are in your path. I just can't figure out why my life keeps falling apart. It just, every time I try to fix it up, it doesn't work. And that's what he's saying. You just keep tripping over the big stone. And this morning, I hold out to you the precious cornerstone, a stone that has hands. And this stone has hands holding out nail-pierced hands saying, will you come to me? Come to me that you might have life. Quit tripping. Quit falling on everything. Come, and I'll give you rest for your souls, and you will never be disappointed if you come to me. I have never been disappointed since coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come, and you in no way will ever be disappointed. Isn't that beautiful? Second, turn to Psalm 118. His second quote is in verse 7. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. And so this is a quote from Psalm 118, verse 22. <clears throat> so in verse 7, I, I want you to hear this. This precious value then is for who? It's for you who believe. The precious value of Jesus Christ is for you. When you come to Him and when you believe in Him, all of that value is imputed to your account. 
This precious value, all the, God saying, here's my choice stone, my precious stone. He's beautiful, he's lovely, he's righteous. All of that is for you who believe. God says, I'll give you that precious value. It's for you, it's going to be to your account. You get it, you're going to possess it. A few weeks ago, I went over how precious Christ was to the Father. He's of infinite value, and even more, he, he humbled himself. This stone took on the form of a man, and this stone was mocked and ridiculed, and he was put on a cross, and he, and he died in your place with the full wrath of God being poured out on him. He's precious, but he's a representative head. That precious value is for you. And I want you to hear this again. I'll say this till I die. That precious stone lived the life that God wanted. He lived a perfect righteousness, and that's for you. I will give to you the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. I will treat you as if you lived that perfect life. And what's more is I will treat you as if you died the death that God demanded for sin. When Jesus died on that cross, I will treat you as if you died on that cross. That is so precious for God to do this. This precious value is for you who believe. You get all of that put to your account. And the longer I'm a minister, I just see so many people who don't believe that the righteousness of Christ is really put to your account. That God really looks at you and says, this is my son or daughter who I am well pleased. Almost everything you're struggling with, that's your foundation. So I'm going to preach it again and again until you believe it. And to, to encourage you, I have people who come up to me who have been here 10 years saying, I finally got it. That stupid cup illustration set me free. Like, boom, lights went off. So don't be discouraged. Keep knocking and asking God, you need to know that. I need to get that into my heart. But here's what Peter does. He has an adversative, a contrast. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected this became the very cornerstone. It's interesting that Jesus quotes the same verse, and Peter heard him. I think Peter learned his hermeneutics from Jesus and how to interpret the Old Testament. And I want you to listen to Jesus in Matthew 21, verse 33. It's kind of long, but I just want you to listen. I think it's important. Jesus told another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers. And he went on a journey. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. And the vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. That's not how you treat them. Boom, kills them, stones them, and throws them out. And again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first. And they did the exact same thing to them. But afterwards, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And they took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And they, they said to him, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. And he will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. And Jesus said to them, okay, you're good at interpreting the parable, but did you ever read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. And it will be given to a nation producing the fruit of it, Jews. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter them like dust. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they understood that he was speaking about them. Hey, he's talking about us. And when they sought to seize him, they feared the multitudes because they held him to be a prophet. So the tenants, the vine growers, beat up the owners and servants when they came to collect like all the prophets throughout the history of Israel's life. And so they decide then to kill the son and surely they will respect him. But instead they kill his son. It, oh, it sounds very familiar to the gospel. 
And then Jesus quotes that Psalm 118. Reject him and you're going to be rejected. The context describes uh, in Psalm 118, it describes the return of the king of, to the temple. So the, the king has gone out to battle and he comes back to the temple to give thanks to God for the victory over his enemies. And the stone that was rejected in that context was the Davidic king. And the builders were foreign nations in Psalm 118. And they rejected the rule of the anointed king of Israel. And so the king cuts off God's enemies uh, with confidence. Both Peter and Jesus now apply this psalm in a very surprising way. The builders are not foreigners. The builders now are the religious leaders of Israel in the application. They believe that they are building God's temple. We're, we're actually the ones building the temple. We're, we're teaching the laws and we're teaching people how to obey. We're building the temple. But they're doing it while they rejected the cornerstone. You're building on sand. You're not building the temple. The very cornerstone you're rejecting. Do you see that? As a result, they are behaving like the pagan nations of David's day and have assured their own judgment because you've rejected the cornerstone and all of your religiosity and all of the things that you are doing. And so the point is that God has vindicated and he's honored Jesus by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand of God. And even though the people reject him, in our day and age, he is being rejected. You might be rejecting him this morning. And he says, they will face judgment. You will face judgment if you reject the cornerstone and even try to build the temple without him. And that's a picture of so many in the church, trying to build a temple without Jesus, trying to build religiosity and morality and, and get out and change as we are the world, we're going to change it. They're building without the cornerstone. And what Peter's preaching and what Jesus preached is there, there's a very, there's an exclusiveness to this message. Men and women are redeemed by him only. Jesus is not an optional leader. I'm tired of hearing there's many different ways to heaven. He is not just a good teacher. He is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies. The ones that Nate read this morning. The ones that we're looking at now. All of these predictions are him. The whole Testament has been telling about God's choice stone that he would bring salvation through. He's been promising and telling them how and picturing it and showing it. So apart from him, there is no salvation. To defy him, to reject him, to disown him, to dismiss him is to be crushed by him. Peter preached it in Acts 4 right out of the gate. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other way but through this cornerstone. And it might seem cool to reject this stone right now, to mock it and to ridicule it. But this stone will crush you when it falls on you, when you die, or when he returns. It, it will crush you to dust. And so I pray everyone in this room would believe and trust in the cornerstone, Christ Jesus. Thirdly, go back to Isaiah. You don't even need to go to that. Just go to back to 1 Peter. I'm just going to share a few things about Isaiah 8.14. Uh, he's going to share that now in verse 8. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and, he, and the quote now from Isaiah 8.14 is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And they stumble because they're disobedient to the word. And so the context once again is in Isaiah 8.11, the nation is threatened once again with judgment. The people are fearful. And the warning is don't follow people as a solution. Don't look to armies to solve this problem. Don't say it's a conspiracy. Don't fear what the people fear. Uh, probably the best word for us today. Don't fear what the people are fearing. 
And there's so much fear in the Western churches that people are afraid. We're afraid of what's going on in our culture, what's going on in our society, the aimlessness of young people, our own futures. Out of fear, we lash out. We try to build empires. We are just a frightened people. And so Isaiah says, this is the one to fear. Fear the Lord Almighty God. He is the one to fear and to dread. And he says both houses, they stumble and they fall and there's a trap and there's a snare. In 1 Peter 2.8, they stumble by disobeying the message. The message that God has been sending and proclaiming through prophets and now his own son and preachers this morning, they're stumbling because they're disobeying this message from God. The message of the cornerstone that has been laid in Zion. It has been laid and everyone who believes will be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Believe this message. Peter grabs the passage now and says, fear him because they stumble and fall. They stumble because in Isaiah's day they disobey the message. They reject the stone. They stumble because it's not what they think. This isn't what we thought it would look like. Jesus is different. It's an offense because he came and instead of saying, you guys are so good, he said, you guys need a savior and you're bad. And they, 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 uh, there was an offense. So they stumbled over Jesus because he wasn't what they thought. He was an offense because he spoke right to their sin and didn't give them attaboys. This stone then, which was to bring life, brought death to many. And it's still bringing death to many. Peter says, this is powerful now, and we'll spend a few minutes on this. He says in verse 8, they stumble because they're disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. They were destined, is really this word. They were destined for it. So they, they've stumbled, they've rejected Jesus, and Peter says they were destined for this. This is a tricky doctrine. One that you can fall into heresy very quickly. As you could say, that they stumble, and if you just look at man's responsibility and take God out of it, now you just kind of got people who, who stumble, and they, there's nothing that can be done about it. God wishes he could save them, but he can't, and it just throws everything to pieces if God is uh, responsive just to us. And the other is that he, he predestined everything, and you take man out of it, and it doesn't matter that they rejected Christ. They stumbled. They, were, they didn't want the cornerstone. Oh, they were just predestined. There was nothing they could do about it. And you get errors on both sides of this tricky doctrine. This is one thing I learned in hermeneutics class, is you got to stay in the context and not come up with major theologies on one phrase. So we got in this passage, they stumble. They reject the cornerstone. And we got that they were predestined to this in this passage. We have both. And this is what theologians call the doctrine of concurrence or compatibilism. And it means this, that God is sovereign over everything. From Him and through Him and to Him are all things. He's the, he's the sovereign God who answers to no one. Every atom and molecule is in submission to this sovereign God. And then we have human beings who are responsible and you're called to repent and to believe and to obey and to pray and seek the means of grace. We have a human responsibility that's been given to us by God. And we state that they are mutually compatible. They're not mutually incoherent. And so they, they, they're compatible. And when we look at them with our own little human minds, we'll come and say, wait, that, that can't be compatible. And so we come and we got to wrestle with this, is that God is absolutely sovereign. God is sovereign uh, over salvation, over all things. But his sovereignty never mitigates human responsibility. That's a hyper-Calvinism, to come and just say, all it is is God decrees everything, so I'm a little puppet. My responsibility means nothing. I, 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 I want to come to Jesus, but he won't let me. That's all, that's just missing it. Human beings in this Bible are morally accountable to God. And they can obey or disobey Him. They can reject the cornerstone or they can come and fall upon Him. Yet moral accountability never makes God contingent upon us or Him merely reacting. That it, God determines all things. 
And so you've got this God who's sovereign and determining and decreeing and man who has a responsibility before God. How are they mutually compatible? How can those two things be compatible? This is a complex issue. It's not easy. Finite minds don't get it real easy. But I can tell you this. There is so much evidence in the Bible that, that they are not incompatible. The Bible preaches from cover to cover both of these. They're in there. You can't get away. You can fall off the horse and go one way or the other, but they're both there. Both are taught. Man is responsible. He is called to respond. He is called to come to this cornerstone and make much of him and believe. But God is sovereign and nothing happens apart from his will. They were destined to this. The problem is when you try and fix it, when you try to remove the mystery that's in these two beauties, you're going to fall into either air, which is determinism, which means man determines everything. God just responds to me. I'm sovereign. I will determine my future. Everything. That's just wrong. And hyper-Calvinism is absolutely wrong, that I'm just a little puppet. I can't do anything, and God just does whatever he wants with me. Both have done much harm to me in my journey to compatibilism. So I can't perfectly explain them or really all the way understand them. How does God rule in time and eternity? It stretches my mind to the farthest horizon. And in my poor limits, I don't know. But I, I, can, I can prove that you must hold to both. Because both are taught in Scripture. But to put it in a neat little tidy package is beyond me. And if you can, I want you to write a book. It'll be a bestseller. So this is crucial for Christians. In Acts 4, a persecution breaks out upon the church. Peter and John are in prison. They get out. They come back to the believers. And in Acts 4, 27, Peter says, For truly in this city they were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with all confidence. And so all the events had taken place in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It was an evil conspiracy. We saw it through the Gospels. And they, they all hated Jesus they were taking those hammers and nails and they hated them. They weren't saying, God, you're making me do this, but I don't want to. Their human responsibility is they hated it. They wanted to put the light out. And yet God says, everything they did was predestined by me. They were carrying out my purposes perfectly Why they had human responsibility and did everything they felt and wanted to do. So we believe both. If you believe only the first, it was just a human conspiracy uh, God's perspective was an accident. It wasn't eternally planned. You lose it all. And if the cross wasn't ordained, you, you, if it was ordained and all of those things, you can't blame Herod, the high priest. Pilate washed his hands of it. No, God did it. So if you can't blame human beings for this, they didn't do anything. So get this. The Christian reads his Bible and says, I'm responsible. And there's a cornerstone that I need to repent and come and believe and make him everything. I am responsible before God to make this, to decide this, to enter at the narrow gate, to choose the cornerstone or not. I'm responsible. You have a responsibility this morning to respond to this cornerstone. Secondly, God is sovereign, and he has wise purposes, and he causes good out of evil, and he's working. He will complete what he began in you, there's a sovereignty to God that is unbelievable that you can rest in and you can trust and be confident. He's working for your good. Compatibilism. Wayne Grudem said this, when we cannot fully understand how this can be, it is for us simply to be silent before our creator and wait for fuller understanding in eternity. If I can't get my mind all the way around this, there's a time to be silent. Clay needs to quit telling Potter what to do. Uh, Anthropos needs to quit telling Theos how to do things. Stop. And there's a time where the full revelation will be made known. Thomas Schreiner said this, They stumble over Christ 
because they refuse to believe in Him and obey Him. Human responsibility. People who stumble and disobey are responsible for their refusal to trust in Christ. And yet God has appointed, without Himself being morally responsible for the sin of unbelievers, that they will both disobey and stumble. I can't wait for community groups this week. (laughs) Get in, have some fun, talk about this. Let's try to iron it out. They stumble because they disobeyed the message. They rejected Christ. And they were destined to this. Their judgment was destined by God. This is all part of God's plan. He is building his temple one stone at a time. And he says, your choice stones are chosen stones in verse 1 of 1 Peter 1. You're, you're not a choice stone. Jesus was a choice stone. There was nothing in us of value that made him choose us. We were just chosen by his mercy and grace. We have been placed in the temple to put on display the glory of God and to offer up now spiritual sacrifices so that his name will be made great as a sovereign, saving, gracious God. And those who reject this cornerstone will be used to give glory to God by showing the vessels of mercy what they were spared from as they abide under judgment for all of eternity. They too will glorify God. And so my question this morning is, how are you going to glorify God? In this temple? Or you glorify God by being crushed as a rejecter. That's your human responsibility here this morning. How are you going to glorify God? Pastor, how do I know which one I'm destined for? By what you do at the cornerstone. That is the question. Will you fall on him? Or will you be crushed when he falls on you? Fear God. He's not a God to be trifled. With. If I see anything in this passage, it's a reverence for God versus this nonsense that I'm going to go live my life for 30, 40 years and drink it up and have a great time and I'll repent on my deathbed. That, this right here is telling you you're dependent on God and you're going to spend 40 years rejecting that God. And when we see in Romans, when he finally just says he gives you over, Esau wanted it and he, and he came back with tears and he said, no, you're not going to get it. This isn't something to be played with. That's the one thing I come away with this morning. Don't you dare say I'm going to come to God later when I feel like it. Most everyone I've ever heard said that has died in unbelief. God is the grantor of salvation. And if this morning you see a beauty and a value in Jesus Christ to save you from the coming judgment, come to him. Keep coming to him. Living stones. Be made alive in Christ. Today is the day of salvation. There's two places. What are you going to do with the cornerstone? Are you going to be apathetic to his word, stumble over him? Or are you going to build your whole life, your whole trajectory of everything that you are and hope in? I'm going to build on Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'm going to build everything on this beautiful Savior. Let's pray. Father, these words of Peter are powerful. They make us uncomfortable. And yet there is such a beauty in this stone. And I thank you for every soul in this room that has seen a beauty in Christ. That they were willing to sell all that they had and buy the field that they might have Christ. I thank you that all the things that they once counted as gain, they count now as loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. God, I thank you that you have opened our eyes, that we were chosen to love the choice one, to come to him, to see value in him, and to make him the center of all of our life. God, we praise you for that. And I pray for any here who have rejected him. I love that these, these verb tenses don't mean that you have to do it forever. Today could be the end of your rejecting him. God, I pray that every one of them repent if they've spent a life of rejecting this cornerstone. I don't want that stone to fall on them and crush them. 
Oh God, why be crushed by it when he was crushed by you for their iniquities? Oh God, let them see the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ this morning and that they would believe, that they would come and they would bow that knee finally to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. God, there's a decision that must be made and no decision is a decision. God, I I, I pray for the unbelievers in our midst. Save them. And I pray for the believers, Lord, if there's any tender consciences that are now wrestling with, am I... Under, am I destined? Am I under judgment? God, I pray that they would just look again at the cornerstone. Let all their fears be relieved as they look at the beauty of the choice precious stone hanging in their place, living the life they should have, now raised in complete victory, and they will follow in that same honor and victory. They will never be disappointed on their judgment day. God, give them freedom in that. Give them peace this morning in that. And God, next week, let us be a people who put on display then the glory of God by being fastened and attached and all of our hope tied to this one, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for this, and we just praise you this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.